Good afternoon. My name is uh, Sylvie Boulanger. I'm with the Canadian Institute of Silk Construction. I'll be your moderator for the session. I'd like to present you um, Alain Nussbaumer, who will be uh, giving the presentation Cool Castings and Green Ideas from Europe. Uh, Alain is presently at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Lausanne, Switzerland. Uh, that's also where he obtained his uh, bachelor's. He's presently in charge of research in fatigue and fracture of steel structures, durability, and assessment of his existing bridges. He teaches steel structure courses at the bachelor's, master's, and PhD levels. Uh, he's the former chairman of the uh, Fatigue Technical Committee 6 of ECCS, which is um, the European Convention for Constructional Steelwork. I think we got that right. And um, he's here today to uh, give us a few uh, innovative ideas from Europe. Thank you, Sylvie, for the introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, so today I want to speak to you effectively about steel casting and green ideas from Europe. The title was suggested by Sylvie, so we're going to see what it means exactly. The presentation objective uh, are the following. I want to share with you some thoughts about the uh, development that are going on in Europe regarding uh, sustainability, durability, and things like that. And also, of course, with the uh, um, looking at the advantage uh, of steel as a construction material for uh, doing uh, structures that are durable and sustainable. Uh, the ideas I will show come not only from Europe, uh, it's all a, a common word, so uh, some things you might already have heard of. So my presentation was, will go as follows. I will first do an introduction, and for that I will talk a little bit about the European standard system, particular for steel structures. Maybe you are not acquainted all with that. Then I will talk and show a few numbers and uh, uh, thoughts about construction and sustainable development. Then I will talk about development in Europe a few of them that <coughs> I heard or I participated uh, in about steel castings, about steel in combination with structural glass, so use glass as a structural material, about uh, possibility to use more stainless steel in structures, and also a, a special new connection system that we have started to develop um, for bridge, make it, but could also be used for uh, um, uh, buildings. <coughs> so the introduction first, and the standard system. Um, when we look at steel construction, we all know the advantage of it. Uh, you have uh, prefabrication, you have low tolerances, you have uh, clean, without dust, uh, uh, possibility of producing parts in a controller control environment. You have the fast erection. You have a high strength to weight ratio and of course goes with it the lightness which makes also that you have less material to transport. Uh, you have the ductility as you can see here from the, uh, uh, the bridge in Mio when they were mounting it how the uh, uh, <coughs> girdle uh, kind of make like a snake over the piles and uh, you have also uh, adaptability and recyclability of course uh, I should add here that um, you have uh, it's only it's not only recyclable but it's also reusable uh, so steel can be reused uh, uh, without going through the uh, the whole process of scrapping it and uh, putting it back into a furnace, etc., etc. So many advantages. And I think this is, for the future, uh, one thing that should be put forward is that uh, the steel construction advantages meet the sustainable development. When we look at uh, uh, different uh, possibility of or, or different uh, um, ways of index of uh, looking at the um, life cycle assessment and things like that, we can see that 
steel structures or steel buildings and reinforced concrete buildings actually are not very much different, even though uh, some say that, of course, to produce steel you have to use a very high energy <coughs> uh, level, but that's not uh, what in the end is so, so important because you have the recyclability, etc., etc. So what I would say is that we have to invest on uh, its advantages, uh, the advantages of steel construction, and not on being the lowest bidder. And uh, I think that's one thing. Uh, you can put quality into the, the construction, and you have to, of course, say and re-say and uh, say many times to the owners that the initial cost of a structure is not the only cost, and that uh, effectively if you do some more um, calculation, you will see that in the end you, you can win, even though maybe you pay a little more at the beginning for some uh, better designed or special materials, like I will say, uh, the, the especially with the stainless steel, it could be said. So I think the, uh, the thing is that uh, this is an opportunity for innovative structural system and products a lightweight, multi-material, multi-function system, and um, <coughs> I think uh, uh, also uh, codes, uh, we have to watch for code developments because more and more you, you may see that they include LCA or life cycle assessment or indexes in, in the codes. When I look for that in, in the European codes, what do we have? The standard system for steel structures. First, we have uh, what is called the 1090 code, delivery condition and execution of steel structures. And then, with that, we have two things. We have the codes for the design of the rules of the structures and the construction product standards. And this is the, the <coughs> framework for designing structures, steel structures in, in Europe. Now, if we go a little more into the engineering part and the Eurocode 3, so here you have a repetition of what I already said. EN 1090 is in several parts. Part 2 is especially for execution of steel structures. And here you can see the different parts of the Eurocode 3. Many parts, I must say. Uh, <coughs> part 1, which is the general rules and rules for buildings. And then you have all uh, different parts here that co consist in different special aspects, like the fire, thin wall products, stainless steel, plate blocking, shell, etc., etc., etc. And in addition to that, then you have some specific parts, part 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, that give additional rules to the part 1 for uh, different uh, structures types, so bridges, tower masts, and chimneys, silo tanks, piling and crane supporting structures. Here you still see different colors because it was in 2005, I think, so all the parts were not in the same status, but today they are all green like that. It is, they are all EN versions, so final version, voted. Now, if we could go and look into the future, then we see that uh, for construction products, uh, construction work requirements, there are coming some other new requirements. The U, uh, European Union essential requirements are, of course, mechanical resistance and stability. Uh, this we know. Safety in case of fire. But now they are a lot talking about adding all the others, that is, in hygiene, uh, health and the environment, safety in use, protection against noise, energy, economy, and heat retention. So today the codes uh, we use are only considering the first two, but in Europe it's going towards uh, codes where the engineer and the architect are asked to also think about the other here. So we are going towards something uh, which is more uh, like these uh, index for sustainability, uh, considering all social, environmental, and economical aspects, 
or uh, things like the leads, as we heard already yesterday, index and things like that. Now, I started talking about uh, construction and sustainable development, so I will uh, continue there. Uh, if we go into Europe and we look at the uh, construction sector, uh, we see the following key numbers. The construction sector is responsible for about 40 of all the um, carbon dioxide emissions. It uses 40% also about of the material and energy in Europe. And the third and also very important thing is that 60% uh, right now of the market is related to building in the stock. So that is to uh, uh, renewing, uh, adapting, etc., etc., things that are already built. So this can lead to uh, two uh, conclusions. First, for the 21st century in Europe, it's going to be a lot uh, towards uh, rehabilitation, modernization, and adaptation of structures, constructions. And uh, also, a second thing that is uh, also a lot spoken about is that we need to redensify the urban areas. Uh, because, of course, when we speak about sustainability, we also speak a lot of, about the, um, the transportation. And if you want to have uh, good public transport, then, of course, the more people you have in an area, the best you can really deliver this kind of, of uh, um, service. So there is a lot of question of using better the land that is already used uh, uh, today. And, uh, of course, this would mean uh, one expression that has been used is city lifting. So meaning that when you, you can uh, add one or two floors on existing buildings, uh, and, of course, this means you have to use lightweight and steel as a very good uh, opportunity there to, to, to do this. Uh, if I may say, when we look in Germany, they say that it's about uh, 340 million square meters of uh, houses and buildings where you can effectively add one or two floors. So uh, that's a lot of uh, uh, work here and a lot of things for, for uh, steel structures, I think. If we look also again in Germany, another way of looking at the uh, this question is to look at the, par the, the proportion. So you see uh, here in 77 new structures were 80 percent and uh, rehabilitation was 20. And here is how it evolves. Today it's already more, like I said, about 60 percent rehabilitation and that's the prospect for 2050. So you see it's still continuing to increase. Uh, so really we have to uh, take, uh, take that into account. Now, if I continue on this same thing and I speak a little bit about construction sector and sustainable development, uh, if I look at building life cycle impacts in terms of energy, which doesn't mean uh, it has something to do with uh, sustainability, I can see the following. I see that uh, you have four different things. You have the resource extraction and construction. You have the energy used during occupancy. You have renovation. And finally, this demolition and disposal. Well, guess what? 80% of the energy consumption is made during occupancy. So it's not so much with the construction, it's mainly with the occupancy. Of course, sustainability has nothing to do with this. I mean, if you use reno renewable energy when you uh, are uh, doing the occupancy of your building, what you use heating pumps, etc., etc., of course, it's not the same as, as when you have a, a, um, a oil tank and you, you burn oil to, to eat your, your hose house. But anyway, it shows that where uh, things uh, are important. And finally, another way or another graph to uh, uh, table to, to show a little bit what I'm 
I want to uh, stress out, if you look at the market share, share of the different types of construction works, here I separated only in three uh, buildings, bridges, and infrastructures, which are uh, tunnels, uh, roads, and other things. Well, we see the following. 80% about the numbers are, are made on, on different statistics that I compiled in Switzerland, France, and Germany. 80% is about what it is for buildings. Bridges, very few. All roads are already almost constructed. It's only 1%, 2%. And infrastructure, about 20 or so. So uh, it means really, even though as an engineer, structural engineer, I must say I'm very interested in bridges, and uh, because you have to do uh, things that are out of the ordinary, you don't have any architects <laughs> over you, etc. But uh, the, uh, the buildings is really the sector. And the uh, second thing that is interesting is when you look at the type of works, you see some differences very uh, uh, much in terms of what is uh, in terms of the market or uh, the total of the work, structural and what is envelope. So really the structural work in buildings is not that much. Majority is in the envelope. When I call envelope, I say everything related to facades, walls, ceilings, etc. For bridges, it's exactly the opposite. Most things, most material and, and cost go into the structural part, the envelope, that are the expansion joints, guard rail, etc., water evacuation, it's only 10% uh, or something. Infrastructure, it's impossible to know, it depends on, on the type of. So one thing that we can see here is really uh, the opposite between building and bridges, so you don't have to think the same way uh, for both type of structures. So e for each type of structure, you have to to find uh, an optimum, I would say. So if we want to go uh, towards sustainable development, um, the uh, new optimization goal is effectively to minimize life cycle, not maybe energy, but uh, carbon dioxide uh, footprint from cradle to grave, this we know, which means change in design criteria but which means also opportunity for innovation in the construction sector in both the structural system and envelope, since you saw what are the, 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 the numbers here. And it also means that, uh, as uh, we heard uh, Mr. Kirian said yes in his uh, uh, keynote lecture, uh, it means that we have to work together. So the engineer, the architect, the fabricator, the erector, all together. And uh, effectively, the durability criteria shall be adapted to the construction work type. So it doesn't mean that because it's a building, you have to build it for 100 years. You, you, you know that you, you can build, depending on the type of building, only for 25 or 30 years. In general, I would say bridges, you are at a tendency also because of the costs. You know that majority of the cost go into the structures and not into the equipment. So normally you build a very strong, shall I say, and costly structure that lasts long. But the building, you can really uh, go maybe the uh, another way. In Europe, here is the numbers that we use when we talk about the, um, the design lives. So we have different uh, working life category for temporary structures, etc. The, the, the main two are the bottom ones. 50 years for building structures and other common structures. And 100 for monumental building structures bridges and other civil engineering structures, so infrastructure systems. So uh, you see already uh, some uh, differences here in these numbers. I don't know how you consider that into the United States, what kind of uh, uh, working life you, you, you use. So now I want to speak about the, the development in Europe. So, 
As I said, all what I've showed up to now show that we, we go towards sustainable development and criteria, and um, that we need better engineering solution in adequation with this change in the uh, design criteria. And I will show some example of stuff uh, that I think could have an important in the future. So I show things about cast nodes, structural glass, new connection system for better durability, and stainless column for better fire resistance. First, the cast steel application. So why do I speak about cast steel? Well, we, we, we know that it's better to do complex things in the shop. Huh? Uh, so, and also, um, in if you want durability, then cast uh, nodes can be an option since they uh, provide a very better uh, uh, stress uh, field uh, into your node, so you have less problem. As uh, you heard in the introduction, I'm a, a bridge guy and a fatigue specialist, so for me, of course, stress flow better stress flow, less stress concentration is an issue to have longer and better durable structures. By the way, I should also say here that uh, if you want about uh, hear uh, or le um, read more about um, durability, uh, sorry, not about durability, about um, cast node application, you can read uh, a paper by Schober uh, Mr. Schober that did uh, that in the 2003 in the NASCC uh, conference proceedings. So I will not show the same example, I will show some, some more on new examples. First things is about castings and first of course you have to not mix up cast steel casting and cast iron, nothing to do. Huh? That's the first thing you have to be careful. Steel castings means first steel. So it means you have a, a material that has not exactly the same chemi chemical composition, but that has the same properties as rolled steel. So uh, no problem with uh, brittle failure or anything like that. Now, furthermore, Today, you have modern steel casting methods. I uh, will show some uh, type of steel you can obtain uh, using what is called the warp converter. So um, this stands for vacuum argon refinement process. So that's uh, what is done by Friedrich Wilhelm Hütte in Germany. With this, you can get very high strength, low alloy grades all kind of different uh, grades, and you also get a very good weldability. And you can also, depending on the type, weld without preheating. So all these go into the direction of simplifying the work and also making it cheaper and, uh, um, and better. Here I show different examples of uh, cast nodes, simple or more complex one. Effectively, that's an advantage of the, uh, the castings, is that you can uh, do very complex shapes. Uh, as you can see here, a lot of m the material that is currently used in uh, civil engineering structure is what is uh, stahl, so uh, casting, steel cast, uh, 20 MN5, uh, which is about the same um, um, uh, grade as what you call um, A72, no, 52, A 572, sorry, 572. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So uh, uh, here you see you can really do complex shape or very large one. This one weighs about 16 ton. So it's uh, a special part for a uh, Novartis campus building in Switzerland. Um, uh, Gary is the uh, 
uh, architect, so you can imagine that he, he made something really <laughs> complex. Huh? Other uh, examples, here uh, a, a building for Porsche, where you have all these nodes are, are cast steel also, look like that, very nice, smooth and uh, and when we look now at the material characteristic of modern cast steel, that's what we, we see. So you have here the uh, construction, the uh, yield strength of the material. Uh, here you have the minimum requirement according to DIN, so uh, to the German or also European code for different thicknesses. And here you have the value that uh, effectively Friedrich Wilhelms Hütte can, can give you. So depending on the type, here you have or, uh, 20 MN5 here. And then you see you can go higher, 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 depending on the quenching and tempering process, up to easily the 900 megapascal, 140 KSI, or even higher, but these are not shown here. Right now they are not used or very little used in construction sector, but there are uh, research going on now to use more and more of these. They are used, in fact, only uh, in mechanical application, a little bit in construction sectors, but for uh, housing of cables and things like that, but not for really nodes into uh, buildings or bridges or anything like that. And also, to further uh, show you that there is no problem with anything related to uh, uh, toughness, these steels, steels have very good toughness property. You see 27 uh, joules is here, and you see what are the uh, value that you can uh, get uh, according to the code, what you need and what you get with these steels. So it's no, no problem. They are very, very tough. Why do I uh, speak about this, about these, uh, these um, cast steel uh, nodes? Well, uh, one thing I've worked on is, of course, the behavior, the cyclic loadings of these. And effectively, question is always, is it better to use tubular welded joint or cast nodes? So I will show you some things about this. And uh, effectively, in uh, welded, the geometry uh, is not so optimal, and you, you favor stress concentrations. Uh, so in fatigue, it's not so good. Uh, also, you have uh, complex cutting and welding shapes, which is not the best thing, so why not go to uh, cast steels? And another thing you can see here is effectively the same thing. You can see how uh, a node behaves uh, under loading, and you see, of course, generally you have cracks here in the between the, the two diagonal, you have a development of crack. In Switzerland, I don't know how it is here, but welders prefer do it do these um, these weldings with backing bars or backing rings. So generally, you don't have any problem of having uh, cracks from the root. It's really coming out here in the middle or at some other point. But mainly, what we have seen is always at uh, at this point in diagonal intention here that you get the cracks. But it's not always the case. There can be other geometries, and uh, you can have effectively cracks from, from the root. So what can we do? We can effectively improve the solution for not having the crack here at the toe of the tension diagonal by doing a casting here and pushing, of course, the uh, welds out of the uh, highly stressed region. Or the second thing, which uh, we can use post-well treatment to induce compressive stresses here so that then you have less problem with fatigue. So I don't have time to speak about everything, but these two ways to improve the durability. I will speak a little bit about the, the, the cast steel here, which I already did. So when you do this, 
Well, guess what? You don't have any problem with the node. Effectively, the cast node is very good. You get the crack like here, where you have the casting here and the tube here, and you get the crack in between. So again, the weld is the, um, the, the, um, the part that is the, weak, the weakest. Um, <coughs> you, um, you have defects in the cast node, but it's more fatigue resistant, so you don't have any problem with the cast node actually. So we made studies to see what would be the best solution to connect the cast node and the tube. Uh, of course, you have this at the beginning, the tube and the cast node, which is not really possible because of tolerances uh, problem. You can't uh, do this solution here. Of course, you can do this kind of things where you have to usine, um, comment um, uh, machine, merci, to machine here the cast node side and then put the steel or ceramic backing. But it's good, but it's uh, very expensive to machine your cast nodes. You have different solutions. We have tried different ones. Effectively, to have some backing here so that you can effectively compensate for the tolerances or uh, try to make it here directly, but with a certain angle here so it does kind of a, a sort of backing but not very good. So we said maybe we need to do the end of the cast node like this, which is common, but then again you have some maybe some problem of tolerance in the the other direction. So um, this is the different solutions. Well, guess what? The best is this one in fatigue. The simplest is the best. And we can see here when we compare relative fatigue strength and relative fabric costs, this is this solution. So funny, but still uh, interesting because then it means that you can effectively uh, do uh, a good job. Uh, of course, you have to ensure that you have a good penetration here at the, at the root, sorry, here at the root, uh, but once you do this, then you can have a very good uh, resistance. Last but not least, the solution here is even better. Uh, because then you have an eccentricity that goes in the right direction and you put compression here into the root. That's the solution that's used in the offshore industry, but uh, uh, in steel construction, often architects prefer this one because from the outside you don't see the difference between the cast node and the rest of the structure. Now, uh, if I look into the, uh, these, into uh, fatigue or also in general, we we'll see that there are advantages uh, using welded and advantages using cast steel. Welded joints, you have a continuity of the cord and it's easier to detect the cracks because they are at the weld toe. But the cast node solution is optimum in support region. So in fact, in the end, you find this kind of thing here is a, a, a bridge that was done in the Netherlands. You find that the optimum is to use both. When you have different features and special features, then you could include directly the support, uh, part of the bearings or things like that, then you could go and very economically go with the casting. But in general, for nodes that are quite standard, not so difficult, you better weld them. Hmm? I have different application. I will go quite quickly. Here is the main station uh, in, in Berlin where you can see these cathedral columns with large uh, cast node at the top and also at the bottom. And uh, also the bridge here is made with some cast node, but in this case, from what I just said, I'm not sure it was good to put cast node here and here, certainly here, but not all the way. Um, another bridge that is just finished is in St. Kilian in Germany also, with also cast node, so very light bridge like that. Again, I'm not sure it was a very good solution to use cast node everywhere in this case. It costed a lot and costed a lot of difficulty during the erection of this, but uh, still 
uh, an interesting application. Here is a noise barrier in Switzerland where also we used cast nodes here and here. You see in this case that it's kind of uh, natural tree shape structures which are quite interesting I, I think. Also another bridge that is in Germany uh, that's also used cast steel here along. So you can see these kind of uh, a mixture between an arch and a, a, a truss, uh, whatever, with these trees. I like this, this one quite well. Then steel in combination with structural glass. So what do I want to talk about here? Well, structural glass, mm -hmm. you have different uh, uh, possibility. If you use simply annealed glass, it's not so good because um, you cannot so well use it in structures. I'll explain to you why. But tempered laminated heat strengthen and you can use them as uh, um, uh, structural material, even it's brittle. Of course, the, uh, the question is what happens with buckling? What happens with shear resistance of uh, glass panels? Uh, glass columns are not so difficult, it's okay, but uh, when you have buckling of panels and things like that, what happens? Uh, you can think about multi-material structural component and we look uh, also at possible lateral stabilization of structures. As you can see, maybe you don't see so much, but this building is quite transparent and doesn't have any bracing. The glass is doing the bracing. So all that's for better use of the materials. Uh, to, to explain a little bit why I'm, I'm speaking about glass and what the problem with glass, I go back to something very basic, which is uh, to look at column stability. So everybody knows um, that graph with the length of uh, the column and the load and the Euler stability limit, bifurcation, and the real uh, behavior with the S shape like this, with different curve, buckling curve, right, that are in function of geometrical imperfection, size effect, residual stress, etc., etc. Well, if we look at crack stability, we can almost say the same. We have a part with a certain defect, it can be a scratch in the, the glass, and a remote load here, expressed by sigma, here is the graph. Now you have the load expressed by sigma, the size of the crack, and you have the linear elastic fracture mechanics limit, which is this. So here the crack is unstable, here it is stable. And now again, you have the uh, different uh, uh, cases, um, the scratch. And now the difference is that in this case, the, uh, the limit is not in function of the stress. Now uh, it's function of a new parameter, which is so the stress intensity factor. But again, you have influence of geometric perfection, size effects, and residual stresses. When we apply this to, uh, to, to glass, so as I said, we have, we have glass where we have defect is present, so we don't have a very good uh, resistance, especially uh, toughness is low, it can't support any defects. And there, therefore, you must have compressive residual stresses where you have the defects, and the defects are on the surface. So with tempered glass, that's what you do. You uh, eat treat in them so that in the end you have residual stress in compression on both the exterior and tension stresses inside where you don't have defects. The compression residual stresses, they go from 100 up to 180 megapascal here. And what happens is that we, when you look at column stability and crack stability, well, the column stability, you have the uh, critical compression, and the, the compression is critical, uh, so the size where it's going to uh, uh, fail. When you look in glass, guess what? It's the tension which is critical. Of course, now you have a behavior where uh, you have uh, divergence phenomena with second order effects, 
the more you load, the more you have the uh, thing going out of plane because of imperfection. And at the end, with this bending, secondary bending, at one point you reach the toughness of the material on the tension side, and that's how it's going to break in this case. So it's not, it's the same behavior, but not the same criteria. But it means you can design glass uh, as a structural element. You just have to take another criteria. So what we have done is we have looked at shear panel testing still going on, replacing the wind bracing glass panels to resist the wind, and we are doing tests like this, where you put an horizontal force, and here you uh, uh, have a glass panel which has either linear or point support, and the idea, of course, is uh, to go further and maybe to propose a complete structural system with glass and steel that can, in this case, be sufficiently ductile to be uh, used and not anymore only you use this glass for its stiffness and the uh, frame around for its uh, ductility. Together they can work. Other things are effectively about stainless steel in structures. So here I will go uh, quite uh, uh, quickly. You have different type of stainless steel, austenitic and what is called duplex uh, steel. Duplex steels are a mixture of austenitic and ferritic uh, um, um, matrix and these can be used as structural material because they are less expensive. You have less uh, nickel I think in, in there. So they have a good strength, a good toughness, and good corrosion resistance. Also, stainless steel, they have a good fire resistance, and they have a very good appearance. So for uh, the, the architects like them. And we can show that it can meet F60 or F90, uh, 90 minutes fire without any fireproofing. So that means you could effectively completely uh, get out of the fireproofing, especially when I'm talking about these things like uh, uh, city raising, uh, city lifting, when you use the top floor and you do the top floors of a building, you add one or two, and it would mean that on these you wouldn't have to put fireproofing on the latest uh, upper floor. Uh, of course, there is no painting, so no uh, pollution due to the intumescent painting to renew. It's highly durable, and of course, when you reuse it or recycle it, you have a lot of, uh, of uh, uh, money for it. Eh? it co it's better to recycle. So now in Europe, you have one code that is doing this, the part 1.4, and uh, here is the alloy, the duplex, you can see here you have a, a, a 316, you have a, a, where it, A36 is here, down here, so you can see that depending, this is so austenitic uh, steel, uh, stainless, and this is the duplex one, so you can have quite good resistance with these special steels. For more information, I draw your attention that uh, a project by the Research Fund for Steel Construction in Europe has uh, looked at that problem or question, stainless steel in fire. They have looked at several different things. New type of laser welded stainless steel sandwich panels, so to produce elements for uh, for uh, floors that would be uh, more resistant to fire with uh, stainless steel and also stainless steel concrete tubular columns and if you go it's just been released now you can download the info on the uh, www.stainlessteel.org fire you can have the report and a lot of information on this uh, work finally new connection system for fast erection the idea is the following here. You have different kind of uh, 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 bridges and uh, bridges with uh, a composite uh, uh, con concrete and steel composite uh, bridges. And now we want to find a new way of doing the, the, the connection. Standard things are uh, you have uh, precast to go fast, you have the steel beams, you have precast concrete elements, then you need joints 
joints, you can do them uh, for long. It has been glued joints between the different prefab elements. But then the second thing is the connection between the concrete slab and the steel underneath. Often we used uh, 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 these little uh, um, uh, encasement where you have the studs grouped and therefore you can then put the pretensioning longitudinal before you uh, put the concrete in. But it's not that good and there causes many problems, durability problems in particular. So how can we solve this? So we looked at the connection that looked like this, where we uh, have the steel beam, the precast concrete slab, and now we put over the steel beam an embossed steel plate like this, welded. Then we have also, in addition, a bonding layer. It's not obligatory, but we, we made it this way in this case to improve the, also the uh, roughness of the top of the beam. It's an epoxy uh, layer with sand. And then you put uh, here a, a cement pass, a grout, to connect the whole thing. In order to, for the grout to really connect both very good, you also do some uh, treatment, water jet treatment of the rib here in the precast concrete slab to have good roughness. And here the tubes are to prevent the grout from going out. With such a connection, we found that uh, the connection is made by adherence and the cement passed, and especially by the confinement of this part. And with this, we find very good uh, uh, things. It's uh, highly durable. We started making, uh, we have done some fatigue tests for continuing to do this. It's very high erection speed, clean. Uh, and I think uh, it could be an interesting solution. I must say that effectively, a lot has to do with the confinement here of the cement pass, which give it both a, a good a shear resistance and also a good um, um, post-failure resistance even when the growth is already uh, uh, broken. So here are the, the conclusions. Uh, I want to emphasize that effectively I think we should take uh, a lot the advantages of steel construction to uh, to show that we, we can meet sustainable development uh, and uh, we need innovative structural system and products and uh, I've tried to show you a few ideas, certainly a lot more to, to do. So the scarce node for better durability or for special applications, this, the use of structural glass for lateral stabilization for better use of the material, the new connection type here for quick erection, and also uh, the stainless steel elements for fire resistance and better durability or sustainability. Different things have been uh, here uh, sponsored uh, for these research, so I acknowledge these and my colleagues. And with this, I, I end my talk, and I'm ready, available for questions. Thank you. Any questions from the floor? Has anybody used steel castings? Oh, a question over there, yes? I have a question regarding the weldings. So the question was, um, how do you do the inspection of the weld between the casting and the normal steel mm -hmm. that is proposed as the ideal solution? Yeah. That's a good question, and uh, the answer is I don't have a good one right now. Um, so uh, there are two things for sure, is that uh, qualification of the, the production has to be made. That's what we have done up to now for research. And now effectively we have a, a project ongoing to look more into these non-destructive examination uh, and uh, to find some, some way of characterizing when it's, it's really good, the penetration, because you are right, it's really a problem. 
The thing I, I shall say is that when you have a backing bar of any butt weld, uh, it's also very complicated to, to, to check the root. In this case, what we see is the, the, the cast node, the ends, simply by being uh, with a certain angle, we don't know exactly what the minimal or maximal angle is, is acting like a backing bar. That's why it's going so well. Yes, George. So I guess the, the, you'd like uh, Alain to comment on the structure that is in Europe right now and if he can compare that to what we have here, perhaps? Yep. Uh, this work is now considered as finished, actually. So now we have EN, so version that are no more uh, experimental Euro codes uh, since the, the beginning of uh, this year, actually, uh, 2008. So it means that all these parts are now uh, completed, finished, the work is finished, but effectively it's uh, all within the uh, um, SEN, so the uh, European Standard Association that has been developed. There were effectively committees for each uh, uh, codes and e each uh, uh, part of the, the, the code with specialists. Uh, of course, some of the specialists were uh, involved in several different parts. I myself was involved in the fatigue part, the quality selection part, and part one and uh, uh, part two here. I didn't touch the, the, the other parts. Um, I must say that it's both a good and a bad thing, these Euro codes, because the um, problem is for steel, a total, I think, when you, you, you combine steel plus steel and concrete structures, which is Euro code 4, so it's another one, you have, I think, 50, 53 parts total, so uh, it's, it's incredible. No, I'm mistaken. It's 53 parts, the overall Eurocode, Eurocode 1, 2, 3, 4, et cetera, et cetera. And out of that, about 27 or 30 parts are steel and steel concrete. So we have 30 different codes. How much does it cost? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I have them for free <laughs> since I'm, I'm working on them. But effectively, it costs a lot. And uh, the second thing is that um, it's all interrelated. So you have to be very careful when you, 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 it's on one side, that's what I say, it's, there are advantages and disadvantages. Of course, the fire guys can review their code without the rest being reviewed. So that's a positive thing. So afterwards, you have only one code that says a new version because new development in this era, and you don't need to have a new complete package. You have only this that, that changes. So that's a good aspect, but it means that these guys have to be very, very careful what they do and making sure that what they require is not influencing some other code and uh, putting some uh, uh, things that are completely incompatible or uh, uh, even saying the opposite as another another part. So that's 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 a complex task, and we are still not not there with this. We have still a lot of problem of uh, miscompatibility between the codes of uh, code that have been reworked after people have looked at them to really reference, cross-reference the whole thing. So hopefully, uh, I think computers will help us in this respect because uh, without computers, I must say, the Eurocode is really uh, difficult to, to use for the day-to-day -day, uh, engineer. Question, Dave? Can, can we answer that question first? So how, may, how much uh, repetition of the steel castings, uh, the, well actually the mold finally, uh, uh, the, the casting so that the mold can be considered um, cost effective uh, in a structure? Mm -hmm. Well, that's a, a good question. We asked that uh, several times. Um, of course, it depends also on the complexity of the, the part, but in general, what they say is you, have, you better have 10 or more. 
same things. Uh, they have done some things like the Berlin Stadium, where, uh, of course, since it's a, a stadium, it's, you can take one quarter, and every node is different, but at least it's repeated four times. But they say that in this case it's not, it's not cost effective. It's still not enough co for identical nodes. And the costs are effectively uh, more expensive, but of course you have to also account for the fact that uh, with the cast node, with the better uh, stress flow, you probably use less material. But when you look at the cost, I think what I add is about uh, 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 something like a factor almost four between uh, the ports, simply the, the steel used in a normal connection and the price of the the kilo of, uh, of steel in cast. So the question is, we have to do this for the video. Uh, so how, um, what was the question? How common are, how common are the um, castings in projects in Europe? In Europe. Um, I would say yeah, one person, one out of a hundred, not more. Uh, I must also say that when we talk with the, the people doing the castings, uh, they are, um, um, they are, um, uh, command, command is, uh, le, leur livre, leur livre de command. Okay. Uh, uh, the, well, they are, they, they, they have sufficient work at least for a year and a half, always. So, I mean, they, they can't produce more anyway. So sometimes now they are in, the, in, in this uh, thing where uh, effectively people would like to use cast steel uh, in some application and uh, because of time uh, uh, they cannot, simply because the producers say, too busy, we have enough already for uh, 18 months. So it sounds like it's a growing, uh, certainly a growing domain. I have one last question. I'm reserving myself the last question. I found it interesting to use um, the um, columns which um, are using um, uh, stainless. You know, st stainless steel. Um, are they going to be, is this something that you can see as a trend? Is it going to be sections that look like other sections, normal steel sections? Or how is that going to evolve? How do you see that evolving? The, um, um, with these um, stainless steel applications, uh, what I see is uh, effectively to use steel as, as, uh, as few uh, stainless steel as possible. So that's why I think for the columns it could be a, a, a possibility. Of course, for the beams, uh, no way. You, so you have to mix up the carbon steel and the uh, stainless steel. Um, now, um, we have looked mainly right now to uh, circular columns uh, for two reasons. First, uh, in duplex steels, they are the only ones that are available, the, the round circular columns. Uh, in austenitic, you can have different sections, uh, I, uh, T, or rectangular, or whatever, but you don't, you don't have them right now in duplex. And uh, the second thing, of course, is uh, wha when you are talking about uh, uh, columns in compressions, uh, the most efficient uh, section is the circular, so therefore then you use less material, and since the material in stainless is more expensive, you better use <laughs> as less as possible. Uh, the question is a lot uh, what is going on on the uh, architect side. So right now what we, we, we try to, to look at is to discuss with architects uh, because in the end, I mean, uh, when you see uh, more and more the architects, they, they, they want to control everything, it, uh, including the furniture that goes into the building they designed. So. I mean, uh, with these costs, uh, the cost of the stainless steel is not an issue in this case because uh, you have a column that's going to be uh, uh, holding there and stay uh, for years and years and years. The furniture will be changed four times and this probably cost much more. 
So that's what we are doing now is to trying to do technique, uh, technology economical uh, analysis to show effectively if you use stainless steel colon in the end, how much does it have as an impact on the overall price of the building, knowing that the structure is only 30% of the cost anyway and 70% is the equipment. Well, on that note, I'd like to thank Alain, and I think he certainly deserves another warm um, applause.